This video is going to be about helping the doc make the right diagnosis. <clears throat> um, it's clear why so many of uh, our viewers re relay frustration with their docs. And this video sounds like in the beginning it's going to be criticizing docs. It's not a criticism, it's the truth. The evidence would indicate that docs make the right diagnosis between half the time and 5% of the time. That sounds bad, right? Um, <clears throat> and it is bad, uh, but I'll cover an article which, uh, which shows that. But <clears throat> the question is not so much how to criticize docs. The question is how to, uh, how to make it better. Well, that brings up the question of why can't we use artificial intelligence? Now, think about chess. This is a picture that was uh, done in uh, 1997. The fellow on the screen with his head in his hands is Garry Kasparov, at that time the reigning world champion in chess. He, that was when he realized he had lost to a computer, deep blue. Actually, at that point, it was called deeper blue or very deep blue, but not just deep blue. And that's, uh, that's an important concept, which we'll talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> the year before, um, Kasparov had also agreed to a challenge from Deep Blue. Deep Blue came out and won the first game, but then lost the match. The programmers, the consultants, the uh, chess masters all got together and learned what they, uh, where, they where Deep Blue failed in 96. And they learned a, a lot of other things as well and put all of that new stuff into the program. Kasparov in 97 was frustrated and he said, I think they, I still think they cheated. There was a whole book written about this potential cheating thing. But if you Google Kasparov and Google talks about um, Deep Blue, it's really clear. He says, yeah, in, 90, in 96, it was a good match. In 97, it, uh, I lost. Ever since, it's just, there is no human that could in any way keep up with artificial intelligence in terms of playing chess. Now, wait a minute. I'm going down a long story about chess, right? So how is that analogous? How is uh, playing chess analogous to getting a med medical history and making a diagnosis? Well, <clears throat> if you think about it, um, playing chess is, all, is a whole bunch of if blank, then blank. In other words, uh, making a parry, reacting to the other side. Guess what uh, making a diagnosis is? If A, then B. In other words, if patient's over 60 years old, then I have a lot of things to worry, to think about. If male, if they have a his family history, if they have... So again, both of these activities are very much an if-then type of activity. Uh, the difference between Deep Blue in 96 and 97, if you look, just look it up on Wikipedia, they'll say that uh, Deep Blue got up, uh, went from planning like five to seven moves ahead uh, to up to 10 to 20 if they needed to. I believe that's what they said. Again, just outgunned the individual human brain in terms of the scenarios it could consider when it thought about the next item. Again, that's the problem that we have with, uh, with docs and making diagnoses. There's just too many scenarios that we have to consider. We're human. We're, we're thinking about, I got to get through this patient. I've got to uh, meet my family uh, for dinner. So I need, I've got six patients between now and then. He's got a bunch of other stuff on his mind and he's not going to, uh, he or she's not, uh, not as likely to spend the time that they need or go through all of the scenarios that they need. So where does that leave you as a patient? Symptom checkers. Uh, you wake up in the middle of the night with uh, stomach pain, fever, sweats. You know the story. It's 3 a.m. You're not going to call a doc. You don't want to go to the ER. So you start looking it up on Dr. Google, the Internet. Good luck on your chances with uh, the Internet because... I'm going to cover a, stu uh, a study which shows that these symptom checkers are really bad. They make the diagnosis maybe uh, a third of the time. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. 
So what's the difference between uh, those um, symptom checkers and Deep Blue? Again, it was that point that Deep Blue was constantly learning, constantly improving. Symptom checkers are built on um, what we call a, an expert logic. So <clears throat> uh, what, what that means is whoever's running the program decides who they think are experts, who they can get out of that group that'll actually come do this, and then those groups, those quote experts, sit around a table and decide what rules should be used. The programmers program it, and there you have it. Well, <clears throat> there is no relearning, not a significant relearning process, or at least there hasn't been until recently. Now there's a thing called K-Health. And yes, it does have those history symptom checker components, but like Deep Blue, it's starting to learn, well, it's been learning uh, in the years that it's being de been developed. It's been learning with ten thousands of docs and millions of patients in terms of their experience and getting better every day. That's the way Toyota, uh, if you talk, I worked for Toyota for 10 years. Uh, and the Toyota folks will tell you, look, we didn't get better by any leap. There was no major breakthrough that we created. Uh, in fact, our, uh, we grew the way we grew, and we attained the status that we have in the automobile industry, not with leapfrogs, but learning a little bit every day, Kaizen. And again, that's what, uh, that's what we need in this symptom checker, this artificial intelligence, quote, artificial intelligence uh, process for helping doctors. Now, <clears throat> the history is a huge issue. In fact, if you go back through history, there are a couple of docs that were uh, very well known and very well respected, um, Hippocrates and William Esler. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back and share my own experience, and pardon me for putting myself in the same, uh, the same sentence or the same breath with those two docs, but when I, I, I am a good doc, and whether I am truly a good doc or not, we'll talk about a little bit later, because I think I have some of the same, I think we all have some of the same problems. Um, starting off in the ER, one of the things that struck me was that other docs tend to talk to the patient less, listen to the patient less, and order more labs. I talked to the patient and I felt like, you know, you could get a lot more information just by listening. And you probably don't need as many labs. Um, I was, then I found out later, I thought I was kind of weird until um, I found out later. William Osler had the same issue. He said, uh, there was a quote, one of his most famous quotes was, he was in the, um, the amphitheater at Hopkins and a, a student doctor was getting a... Uh, history from a patient. He interrupted, very frustrated, and said, listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. So again, it's, uh, there's a huge effort, and like we said a minute ago, major failure rate around getting a diagnosis. So I said I was going to cover two studies. Now, the, the problem is I've got a lot of details in both of these studies that I'd like to cover, but I'm just not going to have time in this video. So I'm just going to um, uh, go through these very, very quickly to help make the points that we need to make, again, for this video. This is Achievement of Rota. This was in the British Medical Journal, uh, June 2015. Um, <clears throat> I actually have some history with Marota. Um, he doesn't know that, but I do. Uh, he did some uh, a study on telemedicine back when I was... Uh, the CMO, uh, Chief Medical Officer for um, MD Live, one of the top uh, two uh, telemedicine companies at that time. And the end of his study, he basically said, look, telemedicine doesn't replace doctor visits. And so I ended up having to go around and say, well, that was a critical comment on that study. What do you respond? My, when I first heard it and threw out, my response was, what were his assumptions in terms of his study? His assumptions were that telemedicine was going to replace doctor visits. That's sort of like saying um, home videos and streaming is going to replace the movie theaters. You got your assumptions wrong. 
And actually, I think he did that with this study as well. That's why I went into that, into that little uh, diatribe. He went to the end of the study. He basically took the 23 major symptom checkers out there. Um, <clears throat> and he said they don't work. They, uh, they get it right 30% of the time. So here's the conclusion. Symptom checkers had deficits in both triage and diagnosis. Actually, for the emergent cases, in terms of triage, triage is, I've got chest pain, where do I go? I can't diagnose exactly what the chest pain is yet, but I know what I need to do next. In those uh, urgent uh, triage cases, the symptom checkers were 80% right. So that's, you know... <laughs> Whether that's better or worse than, than the docs, I, you can't really say, say because the, uh, the doctor study doesn't compare that, but it does compare diagnoses, and we'll cover that in a minute. The point was, though, he said the, um, the symptom checkers are not that great. They only get it right 34% of the time. And uh, again, what this study adds, our study adds that symptom checkers uh, have deficits in both diagnosis and triage. He missed the assumptions again, like he did on the first study back in telemedicine. Here's how he missed it. This is a JAMA study. Um, <clears throat> again, I'll cover both of these studies in more detail. I know there's a lot of uh, viewers that are very interested in details around studies. How did they pick which symptom checkers to look at, what were the scenarios that they put in front of sim symptom checkers, what were the scenarios that they put in front of doctors here, how did they put the doctors there. Um, <clears throat> I'll cover those in later videos, but here's what you need to know about this study. Marotta, this study was done um, two years before and published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Marotta had obviously not done his lit review or he would have noticed this. This line, these uh, open circles, is the, how often the docs got it correct on the scenario when they, on the easy cases. And that was about half the time. This, uh, this side of the graph shows how often they got it right when it was a little bit more difficult case. In other words, what, 5% of the time. So in difficult cases, docs got the diagnosis correct 5, 6, 8% of the time. What's even more disturbing is this. <clears throat> On the easy cases, the docs said, I've, I've got like a 70% chance of getting that right. On the times when they only got 1 in 20 correct, they had almost the same level of confidence. In other words, docs think they're right even when they aren't. Why is that? Because there's no, uh, there's no gold standard. Again, that's what uh, we need in medicine in terms of making a better diagnosis. We need to have some sort of mechanism for collecting the information and finding out was that correct or not and how can we improve that. And that's going to take a team approach. There's no individual doc that's going to be able to accomplish this. Now, you may go back. Speaking of those, I, am, I will cover just a couple of details about uh, the Marotta study of the, um, of the symptom checkers. <coughs> you may say, well, you got a bunch of bad stuff off the internet. Maybe Ask MD. Maybe you think that's bad. Well, Ask MD was in there, but Harvard was in there. And I don't really think that AskMD was any worse than uh, Harvard and some of the others uh, that were there. Um, AskMD, as I mentioned before, drugs.com, a lot of people use both of those. Um, WebMD was in there as well. Again, a lot of people use these. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> skip over a lot of these details. And again, please just comment down below. I am planning to go back and cover these studies in much more detail. But uh, as you know from many of my comments, I've got three or four months worth of topics that I need to cover and things happen. So I often don't get to, uh, 
to go into the details and plans that uh, that I've developed. <clears throat> so let's go back and think about this one more time. What is so? What happened in '96 and '97? Well, there's a a, a comment. This came from a, an IT magazine. Twenty years on. Uh, from Deep Blue and Kasparov, how a chess match started the big data uh, revolution. Again, that is um, an interesting thing to think about. So at that point in time, the standard, the gold standard for chess had to be handed over from an individual man to a team driving a computer. <clears throat> Are we ready for that in... Um, In medicine, oh gosh, I think we're more than ready. I think we needed this more than 20 years ago. Uh, and what's the difference? Is K-Health really going to accomplish what they, they plan, what they think? And uh, like, you know, like they say, don't take my word for it. Look up K-Health on, uh, on the web. And that's what they say. Uh, K-Health has learned from the experience of th uh, thousands of doctors. 10,000 doctors and millions of real cases, um, and they're constantly learning. I've talked with, well, I will, uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute about my own activities with K-Health now. I have a disclaimer. I'm starting to, I'm probably going to do some work with them. Um, <clears throat> wanted to go back and cover uh, William Osler and the Hopkins Amphitheater and make one comment. Uh, and comment about me thinking I was always right in the ER and other docs thinking they were always right. And all these docs thinking, and William Osler, all thinking that William Osler was right. How often do you think he really was right? Again, that's my point. We all think we're right because there's no continuing um, learning process I used to work for Toyota, worked for them for about a decade and did a lot of stuff to set up and, and, uh, and, and improve the healthcare delivery for their, it was at that point going from 80 to 120,000 uh, lives. Now it's much more. Toyota <clears throat> was very clear. They said, you know, we went from a small, um, small shop basically doing, uh, they started off as um, weavers in Japan. Then they developed a, a weaving mechanism, and then they um, got into cars. They were considered very poor quality when they started out, but look where they are today. They're in the lead in terms of the world's automobile production. And they'll say, we didn't get there by some giant leap. We had some giant leaps, but not that many. We got there by watching what we did and improving every day. That's their term. They call it Kaizen. It's a Japanese uh, word. So is K-Health going to be the deep blue, the Kaizen for medicine? Doctors, history, making a diagnosis? Well, they certainly want to be. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, I've got a disclaimer. I'm going to do some work with these guys. I went to uh, New York a couple of months ago, met with uh, Ron Shaw, the chief operating officer on the left, and... Um, Elon uh, <clears throat> Block uh, on the right, the founder and CEO. Uh, can that team accomplish this? Can they accomplish all that they've got on their plate? I don't know. And uh, why did I join them? Uh, I can tell you a couple of reasons. I like Elon and, uh, and Ron and the rest of the members of the team. I like them a lot. Um, and I'm, is it my, so is it that? No, it's not the social issue. Is it money? I'm making a little bit, but I'm not, not making very much with them. Here's the reason. This activity needs to happen. Uh, somebody needs to develop the gold standard for medicine because we need to improve the way we practice medicine. Um, I'm going to be doing a couple of things. I may actually even open up uh, my panel of patients. Those of you who want to be patients may have gone in and seen that I'm not seeing, taking new patients, haven't done it for a few months. One of the things I'm considering doing is opening it up uh, and using um, K-Health 
not quite there. I'd love for you to go in and try K Health. Tell me what you think. Put some comments down below. And again, as usual, thank you. If you've made it all the way to this far in the video, thank you again for your interest.